Good morning. It is very good to be with you this morning. It's a privilege to be part of your 72nd missions conference. That is quite the stewardship of the gospel in and of itself. And so that's, uh, of course, one of the things we're going to be talking about this morning. The theme of our conference this morning is, or excuse me, this weekend is entrusted, discipling the nations one nation at a time. And the biblical con uh, topic of God's desire to delegate to his people and to entrust them with responsibility is probably not a new topic for you. It's probably a familiar one. However, it is a rich theme that permeates all of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, that God delegates, God entrusts tasks to his people. And perhaps you can liken it to maybe going on a hike, and as you're on this hike, there's a river that maybe reappears. It, it, it occurs after you've made turns and twists, and you know it's there. You know it's a significant part of the landscape, but it's when you actually see an aerial perspective of that same plot of land that you recognize, wow, this this river is all over the place and plays a much bigger contribution than maybe I acknowledged as I was kind of walking along the trail. And my prayer for our time today would be that we take some familiar passages that I'm confident you've heard before, and that we maybe look at them from this aerial perspective, and we get to see how they connect in a way that might be very rewarding. We get to see how this theme runs throughout the scripture. Before joining the faculty of Cedarville University, I taught uh, at a Christian school in Texas for a year, and so my responsibility was to teach Bible to the 11th graders and the 9th graders and the 7th graders. And almost all of my teaching experience is at the undergrad level, so I was pretty nervous about these different groups, not having um, familiarity with you know, teaching at that level. Um, and so 11th grade, I thought, well, that's not, probably not going to be too bad. That's close to college. I'll be able to adjust pretty easily. Ninth grade, I thought, I remember ninth grade, so that'll give me some background. But I have to admit, for months, I was terrified of the seventh graders before we started. And I thought, I don't remember seventh grade. I remember sixth and eighth, and somehow seventh got blocked out. Was I really that bad in seventh grade that I blotted it out of my, my memory banks? And so these kind of fears were, were upon me. But as with many fears in our life, right, they're kind of mostly in our head. And once I started teaching the seventh graders, I, my, I developed this really thick affection for them. They were just a special group of people. Uh, I enjoyed their authenticity and their genuineness. In other words, what they were thinking, you pretty much knew right away. There was no filter, in other words, right? So it just kind of came out. And I appreciated that, and it made for some humorous times. Well, there was one time when I was teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, and there was a young man who was sitting on the front row, and he, I don't think he had much of a church background. He wasn't familiar, apparently, with the order of the books of the Bible, and he was kind of slowly flipping to Matthew 5. And I had asked a young lady to read the text for the day. And so as she's reading, and I'm kind of keeping my eye on him, so if he needs help, I can quickly get him there. I mean, he's moving in the right direction, but it's just very slow. I realized that he was paying attention to every word she said. His concentration was deep. He just, it wasn't really in sync with his hand movements. So he was listening to her words, but he wasn't really getting there because he didn't know where Matthew was. And as she was reading the text... She got to those difficult words of Jesus, where Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. And as he heard these words, I'm watching him, his eyes got just huge, big as saucers. And he just blurted out, who said that? And it was just this very pure first time hearing of this difficult text of Jesus. It was a fresh reading, or maybe I should say it this way, it was a reading of the text with fresh eyes, someone who hadn't heard that passage before. And as you can imagine, everybody laughed in the class, but I left with just this example of someone hearing the words of Jesus for the first time in some ways and having to wrestle with what they mean. And so my hope today is that we are able to experience maybe a little bit of that perspective, a, a fresh reading of some familiar texts as we look at them from an aerial perspective. 
Well, the scripture tells a unified story. Genesis through Revelation, we see that God is telling a story that has a beginning, and it has a middle, and it has an ending. We are part of that story. We're part of the plan and the purposes that God has in his uh, overarching plot of the text. God is the main character. Everything does revolve around God. It's what he's doing. It's what he is saying. It's what he is about to accomplish. And you and I are secondary characters. So in other words, uh, we play a secondary role to what God is doing. The scripture is not really about us. It's about God and his story. And so this morning, I want to read from three uh, areas in this overarching story. And we'll begin in Genesis 1 and 2. And then we'll examine Exodus 19, and finally we'll end with our conference verses of 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2. So here's my main point that I want to talk about today. Our God has delegated to us the task of representing King Jesus and his kingdom. I'll say that again. Our God has delegated to us the task of representing King Jesus and his kingdom. Our God has delegated to us the task of representing King Jesus and his kingdom. And so because Genesis to Revelation is one overarching narrative and it tells a story, I've entitled my points to reflect that. So beginning in the beginning, God delegates in his kingdom of blessing. Moving to the middle, God delegates to Israel to be a nation of priests. And then living in the last days, God has delegated to the church to be stewards for the reign of King Jesus. Let's go ahead and look at beginning in the beginning and turn in your Bibles to Genesis 1. And we'll start right at the beginning of the biblical narrative. In Genesis 1 and 2, we see that God is creating his creation. And many interpreters rightly recognize that this is not just a creation narrative, which it is, but it's actually a king who is setting up a kingdom. And he's got his people in his geographic kingdom, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. And this king gives his people a task in how they're supposed to relate to his kingdom. And we end up learning about the quality, not only of the king, but also of the kingdom. And maybe we could call this the character of God in some ways, but uh, it's the quality of the king. What kind of rule does the king have, and what kind of kingdom does he want to establish? We learn quite a bit in these first two chapters about what that's going to look like. We see that we have a good God who enjoys creating beautiful things. A good God who creates beautiful things. And we also see that he's created Adam and Eve so that they can be in his presence and enjoy a relationship with him. And that fellowship with him is unhindered by sin. There's, there's nothing in between God, who is life, and his creation that he's created. A, a biblical way we could say this, there's no death that separates the relationship. That has... That occurs later in chapter 3. But this is the way that God has designed his kingdom to function. And so God has given us some illustrations here of his delegated uh, tasks. And so the first one we see here is that God has made human beings in his image. In other words, the unique characteristic that separates human beings from plants and from animals is the fact that they bear the image of God. They're made in the image of God. And so thankfully the text actually helps us to flesh this out and know what this looks like. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? So let me go ahead and read for us Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now notice the word here in the last part of these, of these verses of dominion. 
Or maybe we could talk about governance or rule. That God has designed human beings so that they might have governance or rule or dominion over his good creation. So the good God selects his good creation, Adam and Eve, to have rule and governance over his good creation, the rest of the order, the world and the animals and the plants, everything about them. So what does this delegation look like? In other words, how are Adam and Eve supposed to view this uh, responsibility that they have? And we see here that God wants them to keep, particularly the Garden of Eden, I believe, in its good and perfect state. In other words, they're supposed to tend the garden, they're supposed to keep the garden, they're supposed to watch the garden. All of these are terms that are in Genesis chapter 2 for their responsibility. And it seems like they're supposed to keep the Garden of Eden in its good state. Perhaps we can liken this to you and I being asked to house sit by a coworker. A coworker would maybe want to go on vacation and say, can you water my plants and can you feed my pets and can you check my mail? Maybe stay at the house if you would. In fact, go ahead and enjoy anything that's in the cupboard. Just clean it out. Anything in the fridge is yours. You're welcome to have it. We can kind of liken this to maybe what God is doing. He's showering them with abundance. He's saying, enjoy yourself. Everything is good. But your responsibility is to keep it good. In other words, keep it like I gave it to you. And the same would be with this illustration of you house-sitting. Your neighbor leaves, and they expect to get the house, and the same way they got it back. So this means that would it be okay for you to have a huge party where part of the property gets damaged? No, that would not be something that your friend would want you to do. Is it okay for you to sell their furniture to make a few extra dollars? No, they wouldn't want you to do that. Can you strip the house down of all of its copper piping? No, that's absolutely not, right? That's not one of the options here. So the owners are expecting to get their house back in the same condition that they loaned it to you. God delegated to humanity to keep his creation in the same manner that he gave it to them. He gave them real responsibility. He gave them real trust, if we want to say it that way, or trust in them. Now, this is not the only illustration that we see in these first few chapters. A second illustration appears in Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 20, and we see here that God entrusts the naming of the animals to Adam. Now, the context here is very clear. The purpose that God is, or one of the purposes that God is doing this is because uh, Adam doesn't have a helper, and so in the process of naming the animals, Uh, Adam realizes that there's none like him, and so God makes Eve for him. And so, of course, we see marriage established and other good things here. But I want to focus on really just the idea that God here entrusted naming of the animals to Adam and focus on that as kind of a, a, a part of the relationship of the divine and human here. Then the Lord God said, and this is verse 18 of chapter 2, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. Here we see God delegating before the fall took place. Here we see God tasking Adam, I want you to provide names for all the, all the animals that I've created. God, as the sovereign king, delegated to a part of his creation to not only have jurisdiction over that creation, but actually to be the one that names them. And the text doesn't tell us that God was kind of lurking over Adam's shoulders, you know, maybe kind of making noises when he disapproved, like, uh, don't go down that way. Don't, don't call it that. I want you to call it something else. We see that it really seems like God genuinely entrusted Adam to come up with names that would distinguish them one from the other. In other words, God created Adam to be creative, and he expected Adam to use that creative ability to name the animals. So God never corrects Adam and says, hey, that's a, clearly a duck, not a platypus, That's a lion, not a cat, you know, those kind of things. We don't see those kind of corrections going on. 
I can't help but imagine, and I'm imagining here because the text doesn't tell us, I can't help but imagine that God was actually really, uh, had a lot of joy, maybe that's the best way to say it, at watching his created, creative creation name the rest of the creation. I, can't, I just can't imagine that bringing him a lot of joy and pleasure, that they were functioning the way he had made them to function, and that they were doing it, of course, without sin. All of this occurred prior to sin actually entering the world. And these two examples give us a significant glimpse into the relationship that God desires to have with human beings. From the beginning, God has been entrusting people with tasks, and he holds them accountable for how they fulfill those tasks. We know this because when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, when they rebelled, they were exiled from the Garden of Eden, and they were separated from the presence of God. So as we move from Genesis 1 and 2 and move now to Exodus 19, if you want to go ahead and make your way there, we have to do some catch-up here in the biblical story. What happened after Genesis 3 to get us to Exodus 19? What's going on there? And it's important to realize that, of course, Adam and Eve ended up rebelling against God. They believed the serpent's narrative instead of what God was telling them. So God was telling them by the things that he does, I'm a good God and I've got your best interest at heart and I want to bless you and I've given you a job. I've given you everything you need in order to fulfill that job. And then the serpent comes along and says, well, God's not really as good as he says he is. He's actually holding out on you. He knows if you disobey him that you will be able to be like God. And of course, Adam and Eve are persuaded and they rebel against God and God kicks them out of his good kingdom. And this brings separation between human beings and the, uh, God that of course begins this plot line of the story, the storyline of God where he is going to redeem his creation. Now there's some significant things that happen here early on. Genesis 3.15, God does not leave Adam and Eve without hope. He says that Eve will have a child that will crush the serpent's head and will be bitten on the heel in the process. And this is very ambiguous. But for sure, it communicates a couple things. One is that God is not leaving them without hope. There's going to be a future time where God is going to fix the sin problem. And it's going to come through a human being, through the line of Eve. And we see God pick up this plan a little bit later in Genesis 12, where he selects Abraham and he makes promises to Abraham. He says... Abraham, you are going to be blessed. And anybody who blesses you, they're going to be blessed. And anybody who curses you is going to be cursed. But then the ultimate thing I think that he says is that through you, everybody in the world is going to be blessed. So this lets us know that God has not given up his desire to have fellowship with human beings. There's an international purpose in God's selection of Abraham. Of course, Abraham has Isaac and Isaac Jacob, and then from Jacob we have our 12 sons who become 12 tribes, and from this the nation of Israel is born. And it is at this point that Israel has been brought out of Egypt, and they are at the foot of Mount Sinai. So now having begun in the beginning, let's go ahead and move to the middle, because this is where God delegates to Israel to their task to be a nation of priests. So God is at Mount Sinai, Israel is at the foot here, and it's probably one of the most remarkable texts in the Old Testament because we have God's presence with his people again, that's pretty unique. We have God forming a relationship with his people via covenant, that's very unique. It becomes one of the backbones or the cornerstones or however you want to frame that as part of the biblical story. This becomes a very significant text in reading the rest of the Old Testament. So when we look at Exodus chapter 19, we see this. This is verses 1 through 6. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they set, up, so they set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. And there Israel encamped before the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. For the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests 
and a holy nation. So in this passage, God tells Moses that Israel will be God's people and that they have a special mission, a special function in relationship to all of the other nations that are on earth. Israel has been selected for a purpose. And that purpose is so that they can be a kingdom of priests to the rest of the world. So we need to unpack this a little bit. What does it mean to be a kingdom of priests? You, you may be asking the question, well, did, doesn't Israel eventually have a tribe of priests? And you'd be correct. Like at this moment in the story, they don't yet. But the tabernacle is going to be built here in just a few chapters. And the tribe of Levi is going to be selected to minister in the, in the tabernacle. And that tribe of priests... Is the one, they are the ones who are the mediators or the representative of God to the people. So remember what I said earlier. In the Garden of Eden, human beings were in fellowship with God and they were in the presence of life itself. And then after they sinned, of course, there was this separation and death entered. And we call death that separation. And because of the sinfulness of human beings, they can't be in the presence of God. Because as soon as they are in the midst of God's presence, they're destroyed because he's holy. He's good. And life cannot accommodate death. Life ends up swallowing up death. It ends up destroying it. And we see repeated illustrations of this in the Old Testament where people violate God's holy standards. So you know what he does? He designs the tabernacle and he designs the priesthood and he designs the covenant so that Israel can have fellowship with God. They can be in a mediated relationship with God. And so here we kind of take from that and learn that, wow, Israel is supposed to have that exact same function with the rest of the nations. Just as the tribe of Levite mediated God's presence to the other 11 tribes and also mediated the 11 tribes and their relationship to Jesus, uh, excuse me, to Jesus, jumped ahead a bit in the story, to God, we also see here that Israel as a nation has the similar function that to the rest of the world internationally, they are supposed to be providing some kind of mediatorial role for the world as they can enjoy the presence of God, as they can enjoy life and not death. So the nations were to know about the one true God because of the nation of Israel. The Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Edomites, they were supposed to have access to God through Israel. Israel was the one who was given the law and the promises about a coming redeemer. They were the ones who could provide hope that God was actually going to deal with sin and how people could experience life. In fact, Paul actually talks about this in Romans 3 when he's talking about the advantages of the Jewish people. He says, what advantage has the Jew or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. They were entrusted with this. The, the presence of God, the tabernacle, the, the covenant, the very revelation of who God is and what he is like. So notice this word entrusted. They were given this task and it was delegated to them to be a kingdom of priests. Part of this was supposed to be accomplished by Israel being a holy nation. You may remember they were a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In other words, as Israel was separate from the nations, not in a way that was intended to um, disparage the value of the nations, but they were supposed to be set apart for God's use and function. They were supposed to be themselves holy, unique and different from the way the other nations operated. They were supposed to be holy, but instead of being that way, they actually became like the nations in almost every way. And as you read through the Old Testament, you realize that one of the reasons that God ultimately ends up judging Israel and bringing them into exile is because of not only their failure to keep the covenant, but because they become no different than the other nations around them. They are just like the nations that God was seeking to judge. And so, unfortunately, just like we concluded with Adam and Eve, that they failed and they suffered exile, we see here that Israel faces the same judgment. Their failure to have a relationship with God the way he had designed it, their failure to fulfill their function, 
Their failure to be distinct ultimately caused them to lose the promised land. They were exiled, the northern kingdom into Assyria, southern kingdom into Babylon. And that brings us really to our third point as we kind of move to the New Testament here. So as we move uh, from Exodus 19 to 1 Corinthians 4, which is our conference verses, we move from the middle of God's story to living in the last days. This is where we're at in the biblical story. And so once again, we need to summarize the biblical story, moving from middle to the end. And so there's some tremendous things that have happened here. Once again, we need to recognize that God, his plan is not thwarted. Just because Adam and Eve failed, just because Israel failed, God has not given up on his desires, nor has he ceased working with human beings. In fact, we see something incredibly significant going on here. God ends up coming to earth as a human. So we learn about the birth of Jesus, and we learn about how he is God in the flesh, fully human, fully divine. We see that Jesus ministered to his own people through signs and wonders and, of course, revelation of who God is, that he was rejected by them. We see that he was murdered by his own government and then raised back to life by God himself. We recognize Jesus as our God who became like us in our humanity, although without sin, so that he might save us from the dominion of sin. He is also our king who was promised in the Old Testament to come through the line of David. And we see that the Father has given him a kingdom which is established, but it's not yet fully under his dominion. In other words, we still look to a future time when God's kingdom on earth will be fully uh, having all of his enemies put under his feet and his dominion will be complete. We see that God has created a new people. These are made up of those who have put their trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for their sins. This people is an international people. They are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. So in other words, they have the very presence of God with them all the time. The new people is called the church. And this is the people that you and I belong to. We are this people and our identity is determined by King Jesus. So to the church, God has also delegated a task that's very similar to the delegation that he's already done with Adam and Eve and with Israel. They too have a mission. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 here, verse 1 and 2. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. First, I just want to make an observation here that Paul describes himself as a servant or a subordinate to Christ, to King Jesus. And Rich did a great job on Friday talking about how uh, this idea of being entrusted is being entrusted to serve and he explored the concept of what it means to be a servant or a slave uh, from this passage. Very helpful. I want to kind of focus on part B of that phrase, that we are servants of Christ. And make sure that we recognize that the Greek word here, Christos, is not a name for Jesus, but it's a title of Jesus. It's a function for Jesus. It, it means the anointed one. And so Jesus is the Christ. And this comes from really the Old Testament, where, of course, written in a different language, written in Hebrew, but there's a word there that means the same thing, the anointed one, Mashiach, where we get the word Messiah. And priests and kings were anointed with oil for a special service. And, of course, Israel's kings were anointed, and they ended up being almost entirely a bad batch together. Only eight good kings, and they were all from the southern kingdom. And so as the prophets told us, and of course as Moses told us, and as God tells Eve in Genesis 3.15, there is this expectation of a coming individual, a ruler, one who is going to be not a Mashiach, but the Messiah, capital M. And so Jesus comes along and he says, I'm that guy, I'm the king. 
I'm the Christ. I'm the one you've been waiting for. I'm the anointed one. And so when we read that Jesus is the Christ, we're reading that Jesus is the king. He's the king of a kingdom. And we are his people. <clears throat> so when Paul states that he's a servant of the king, he recognizes that his life, all of his goals, his passions, his pursuits, are all done in submission to King Jesus. Second, we also notice that Paul talks about being entrusted here. He talks about being a steward of the mysteries of God, a steward of the gospel. And John did a great job last night of talking about how we are entrusted to engage people. And so it's important for us to recognize here that these mysteries of God, the gospel message, has to be done with the end goal of desiring discipleship investing in people's lives, it, it means that we have to be engaged in that task for the long term. It needs to be, the gospel needs to be told in a way that it is understood. It needs to be translated into various languages and cultures so that in their context they can understand clearly what the message is. It's not an easy task. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes creativity. And so Paul here talks about this idea of being entrusted with this task of getting the mystery of God out. And then third, let me just draw our attention to the fact that this is a task that's been delegated to the church. So all of us share in this mission. It's required of us that we be found faithful to the task that's been given to us. God has entrusted the message of the gospel to the church and he's delegated to the church the stewardship, the responsibility of being faithful with the gospel of King Jesus. Well, if we just pause here for a second before we jump into some application, we recognize that all throughout scripture, from beginning all the way up to living in the last days, we see that God has this habit, this pattern, this desire to delegate tasks to his people. Adam naming the animals, all of humans being made in the image of God, Israel tasked to be an international priesthood, and then, of course, the church tasked with the gospel of King Jesus. And so it's appropriate this time, as we think about this, you know, to ask the so what question. What are we supposed to do with this knowledge? And I like to ask a couple of questions whenever I'm thinking about application. When I read a text and I'm thinking about it, whether it's devotionally or for study, I like to think, okay, what does the text want me to, how does it want me to think differently now that I've read this? What does it want me to do? What am I supposed to, how am I supposed to set my values or my affections now that I've read this text? So should my thinking fall in line with God's way of thinking in some new way? Should my behavior line up with God's righteousness in some way? Should the things that I love and the things that I hate, should they line up with the things that God loves and God's, God hates? Should my values be in conformity to what God's values are? And so I have a couple of application points here to think through and how we might apply this theme through Scripture. First, as a local body of believers, we're to be creative in how we accomplish this task. And I already mentioned a little bit ago, but uh, just to remind us, the, the task is not easy. It is difficult. It, is, it takes uh, effort, takes energy, takes creativity. There are hurdles that have to be jumped over. There's problems that have to be solved. And these are ever-changing and new for every new generation. So 72 years you've had your missions conference, and this is commendable. It really is, and it needs to be commended. And so I commend you. I'll just be repetitive. How's that? You're commended. And yet I'm sure that if, if we were to look back at the history of missions conferences, probably there would be still some fundamental similarities of tasks or challenges to the task that would be threads throughout all 72 years. But I bet there would also be new opportunities and new ways of thinking and people coming up with new ideas and how we might disciple and get the gospel out. And that's what we're called to do as a corporate local church. All of us as we come together are to wrestle with that task, how we can be creative in getting the gospel out. 
I remember having a conversation with my grandfather before he passed. My wife and I were just beginning uh, our service with Ethnos 360, and my grandfather was complaining about the missionaries in the church, his church. And he said, I don't understand it. We give them money every year, and I don't see anybody getting saved. And I was kind of stunned at that, because it was such a mechanical process, almost like a vending machine. You put in $5, and you get out some chips or something. I thought, is that really missions to you, that you just pay money and then out pops saved people? I mean, that is just not the way it works. It is incredibly more difficult than that. And I'm not just talking about language and culture and how to disciple and politics and government and all of these things that create real hurdles and challenges for the church. It is those, and then, of course, it is just people and working with them to persuade them of their need for Christ, right, and the grace of God and salvation. Well, a second one here, moving on from a corporate application to an individual application. You and I are to participate using our spiritual gifts our prayers, finances, and passions. Every time you show up to church and submit yourself to the preaching of God's word, you're participating in the growth of the body, the maturing of the body. Every time you come up alongside a fellow believer and ask them how they're doing genuinely because you love them and you desire to be involved in their lives, you are furthering the mission of the church. Why? Because we're a body with many parts, And we need to keep all these parts healthy so that the body can accomplish its goal. And so each of us has has a role in that. And if we're not functioning well, then the body is hurting. And if the body is hurting, then we can't fulfill our ultimate function of um, fulfilling our stewardship with the gospel. So when you and I participate and are faithful to the local body, we're actually engaging in mission. And of course, we add to that this desire to submit ourselves to what God has for us to do. And some may have some unique roles in how they're fulfilling that mission in that local body. Well, one last one, one last application here. I encourage you to submit your lives to this overarching drama that we've been talking about. In other words, the scriptural story from Genesis to Revelation is a coherent story, and you and I are living in the last days, and we can look back to see what God has been doing through his people and his desires and his heart, all of these things, and we can have that that helps us to understand how we're supposed to fulfill our portion of the biblical mandate. And so as we're living in the last days, I think it's important that we regularly remind ourselves that we need to submit to the authority of this story, the authority of the word of God for our life, to recognize that we not only have purpose, but that we have something that we're looking forward to. And this kind of leads me to my, my last point, and I'll conclude with this thought. I kind of envisioned this last, pop, uh, this last point here to be kind of like when you're watching a MCU movie, you know, maybe the Avengers or something like that, and they have those special scenes in the credits. This is the Easter egg. This is your sermon Easter egg, okay? So as, as we've talked about beginning in the beginning and moving to the middle and living in the last days, I think it would be wrong of me to not make sure we also talked about God's finale. So finishing at the finale, God's kingdom has arrived fully in the new heavens and the new earth. And I don't have these verses on the slides, so if you would turn to Revelation 21, just want to read a a little glimpse about the new heavens and the new earth. Revelation 21, verses 22 to 26. Revelation 21. So the end of God's story involves the nations. It involves the nations enjoying the very presence of God, just like Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. So Revelation 21, verse 22 says, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day. 
and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. This is the ultimate hope that you and I have, that we share. Living in God's presence in the new heavens and the new earth, where King Jesus is ruling in holiness and righteousness. And I just want to make this last observation. Notice how the nations are bringing glory to the Lamb. You and I are part of that process where we get to work towards the nations glorifying King Jesus in the new heavens and the new earth. Let me go ahead and close us in prayer today. Father, thank you so much for your great love for us. Truly, you are a good God. And we come to you humbly saying thank you for the work you've done in our lives and for the work that you're going to continue to do. Lord, I pray that you might continue to impress upon us how we might share your love uh, with those around us in the local body here and also with a hurting world locally and globally. Give us wisdom, Lord, as we navigate how to be faithful stewards of the task you've assigned to us. And Lord, I just pray that you might continue to conform us into the image of your precious Son. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.